You want a war? You're gonna get one. Forget the lies, the money. We're in this together and through it all. They said that nothing's forever. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the 29th of December 1997. We made it the whole way through 1997 while covering every episode of Raw, every episode of Nitro and every pay-per-view. 1997 was a great year for pro wrestling and I'm very happy that we got to the end, but things are going to get interesting in 1998. Tonight Raw comes from the Nassau Coliseum in Uniondale, New York, while Nitro's live from the Baltimore Arena in Maryland. It's the night after Starcade 1997 and quite simply WCW has some explaining to do. If you missed the Starcade video check it out ASAP just in case it gets taken down. Before we start check out this jam up guy right here, Julio infiltrated the new Japan dojo and he spiced the place up a little with some Saturday ride fever. Julio was then immediately offered an NJPW contract, he was paid 500 million USD and he's been promised a main event match at Wrestle Kingdom 17. Congrats Julio. Alright, on with the show. WCW's in full celebration mode as balloons fall from the sky during the show's open. DDP won the US title, Sting won the world title, and Larry Sabisco saved Nitro from the New World Order, so everyone's in a great mood, except those who paid for Starcade last night. The Nitro girls dance in the ring before heading up the ramp to welcome Larry Sabisco to the show. The living legend takes his seat as Mike Tanay bows down to the living legend's greatness, and Larry says he wears his WCW shirt with pride tonight. Sabisco said Bret Hart refereed his Starcade match with tradition in his blood, and you know, I do like Tony Schiavone, but Tony's gonna be a smug little bastard during this whole show on commentary. Because NWO is for losers. WCW's giving me a reason to celebrate tonight though because Glacier's gonna take on Bill Goldberg in our opening Nitro match. On Raw, Goldust and Luna cut a promo. Glacier thought he was being smart by attacking Goldberg as Billy Boy was just getting into the ring, but he gets smacked around the head for being a little bitch. He then tries to kick Goldberg but he gets his leg caught and Bill lifts his opponent up. It's a little shaky for a moment but seeing as Glacier gets his back broken from the slam, I'm not gonna complain at all. There's a spear right there, let's see that again. Ah, yes, yes. See Goldberg's face right here? I'm pulling that same face right now. The match ends with a jackhammer and the crowd goes nuts. This audience is already way more fired up than the crowd who attended Starcade last night and it's good to see. With this victory, Goldberg is officially 13-0. WCW are not announcing any numbers so far, so it'll be interesting to see what they say when they start counting Goldberg's victims. On Raw, New Year baby Goldust comes to the ring with Luna and Goldust wishes everyone a happy new year and he puts his name in the 1988 Royal Rumble. Yeah, 1988. Goldust heard that Steve Austin's in the Rumble but tonight Goldust wants to spank Austin's ass and give him a present. He pulls out a pair of ladies underwear and Goldust says Austin can be Ken while the bizarre one can be Barbie. Golda <laughs> Goldust tells Austin to bring his little pink Corvette to the ring and let's get it on. Brilliant. The glass shatters and Stone Cold comes to the ring. He tells Goldust to suck on his little pacifier because Austin has something to say. Stone Cold doesn't believe in New Year's resolutions. He got dropped on his head in 1997 and was almost paralyzed but he's still here and Austin promises the bad language and violence is gonna continue in 1998. Austin says he's not gonna fight Goldust but he does have a surprise for the bizarre one. A giant box lowers from the ceiling and Austin fills the time by telling Goldust that he sucks. Austin brings the box into the ring, he removes the cover and it's a cropper, it's cropper 316. Austin says he surveyed a few construction workers and it smells awful in there and Austin says Goldust can do this the easy way or he can do it the hard way. Goldust jumps in the ring and he hides behind the shitter, he thinks he's gonna get away with a snake attack but Austin saw it coming. Goldust gets the door slammed in his face, Austin performs a back body drop, Goldust then gets thrown into the outhouse and when he walks back out he takes a stone cold stunner. With Goldust back inside Austin pushes Cropper 316 over and Stone Cold says that's the first commode of whoop ass he's ever opened up and it won't be the last. 
Stone Cold Steve Austin's gonna compete in the 1998 Royal Rumble, and you gotta believe Stone Cold's the favourite to win the whole thing. Oh, there's another box on the entranceway, a wooden box or a giant crate. Nobody knows what's inside this mysterious and ominous box, but I'm sure we'll find out later. The biker Michael Lager's take on Los Bariquas on Raw, on Nitro, Bret Hart cuts a promo. So the hitman proved last night that he's not part of the NWO and we're now hopefully gonna learn who Bret's gonna go after for his first rivalry. Bret says a lot of people had doubts about where Bret was gonna go, but he judged the situation and actions speak louder than words. So last night was an example of just as prevailing as it's supposed to, and as for the NWO, those guys are the lowest, most evil, rotten, corrupt bunch of scum. I was hoping he'd say rotten stinking hyenas here and I'm just gonna pretend like he did. Brett says the NW remind him of the scum he left behind in New York and it was an honour for Brett to see the rise of WCW at Starcade. Hart looks forward to great matches, he looks forward to satisfying the fans and Brett mentions the giant Lex Luger, Chris Benoit and WCW champion Sting as guys he'd like to work with and test his skills against. WCW's gonna find out what the excellence of execution's all about and it's time to show WCW fans why Brett's the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be. Brett then says the NWO are gonna pay the price but the guy who has the biggest price to pay is Hollywood Hogan. Brett says Hulk dodged him when he left the WWF back in 1993 and Brett's been looking for Hogan for a long time. Hulk can't run, he can't hide, it's time for Hogan to finally face Brett in WCW. Interesting stuff here, Brett vs Hogan makes sense, but the only problem with that is that Hogan has a shit ton of unfinished business with world champion Sting. On Raw, the Barigos vs the DOA is billed as a Long Island Brawl, which means it's the exact same nonsense as always. They even had the fucking nerve to show a replay from July 1997 when the Barigos wrecked one of the DOA's motorbikes, fully highlighting that nothing at all has changed since this feud began. It was supposed to be 3 on 3 here, with Crush and Jose Estrada not competing. Crush had actually left the WWF over the Montreal Screwjob, so the dirty old assholes don't have their leader anymore. God love them. Savio kicks Jose Estrada by accident and Chains covers Jose for the win. Yes, the same Jose who wasn't actually part of the match. If they don't care about it, then you shouldn't either. Triple H cuts a promo next on Raw while Van Hammer takes on Chris Benoit on Nitro. We also have a Ric Flair promo. The Nitro match was once again supposed to be Raven vs Chris Benoit, but Raven isn't going to compete tonight. The Flox leader says if Chris Benoit insists on receiving punishment every week, then Raven insists that the Flock inflicts it. Thanks Raven. Van Hammer's going to do the honours this week. Great. And Benoit tries to attack the Flock during his entrance and Chris gets his ass kicked. He gets dumped back over the guardrail and Big Van Hammer performs a knee lift in the ring. Someone holds up a sign that says Raven fears soap as Hammer continues his assault. Benoit gets set on the top rope for a superplex and oh oh, easy boys, easy. Give him credit though, Van Hammer does manage to pull off a pretty impressive vertical suplex. Almost immediately afterwards he misses a running corner attack though and that's it over. Benoit applies the crossface and the flock hit the ring. This time though, Benoit has some backup. Never mind that shit, here comes Mongo. Even after getting his head shoved up his own ass by Goldberg at Starcade, Steve McMichael's here to help his old four horsemen comrade and the flock get wiped out. Will horseman business once again get conducted on Monday Nitro? Let's hope so. Speaking of serious horseman business, Ric Flair comes out next for a promo and Flair starts off by congratulating DDP. Page can style and profile with the US title, but Flair says Hennig still has a date with Destiny. Flair vs Hennig will happen again in the future. Flair also congratulates Sting and the Nature Boy gives Bret Hart credit for doing the right thing. Flair knows that Bret said a few things about Slick Rick, but Bret didn't mention Flair's name during his promo tonight on Nitro, and Flair thinks that was a little disrespectful. Flair pulls out a column from the Baltimore Sun that had a quote from Dave Meltzer. Meltzer called Flair the greatest in the history of the sport, and it looks like Flair accepts that as proof that he's better than Bret Hart. So yeah, there you have it, promo over. 
On Raw, we were supposed to have an Undertaker interview, but Triple H is in the ring with China and he's on crutches. Hunter says he's sorry to disappoint his legion of fans around the world, but Hunter can't defend the European title tonight. Hunter dislocated his kneecap last night and he's on the shelf, and this was legit by the way. He and Sean had a tag team match against Dude Love and Steve Austin, and Hunter's now out of action until February. Hunter says Owen's just gonna have to wait it out, that Owen Hart vs Triple H match has now been cancelled. Helmsley moves on to The Undertaker and Hunter tells the dead man that Sean isn't here tonight. Sean's got the shakes and the sweats at home, sounds like withdrawal to me. So Taker too will have to wait it out before getting his hands on the heartbreak kid. Undertaker's theme music begins playing in the arena and a bunch of druids bring a casket down to the ring. The commentators say the dead man has to be inside, but Triple H says there's only one thing to do at a time like this, break, break it, it down. down. DX's theme song plays and there's Shawn Michaels right there. He didn't have withdrawal after all, he's happily high as a kite, way hey. Sean has some pyro set up in the ring but it doesn't go off, you can see Sean and Hunter complaining about this for a second, and then we get a look at the DX casket, great job lads. HBK says there's two new members in D-Generation X, this has to be the outlaws right? No, it's China's Tatankas. Hunter says if China had a nipple for every time someone said she was the breast looking woman here, she'd be a millionaire. No mate, she'd have quite a few nipples though. Hunter also thinks the group's name should be changed to Double D Generation X, and that's gonna do it for the boob jokes. Sean says Owen Hart's lucky that Hunter's injured, but in due time Triple H will be better and Triple H will rid the WWF of that tiny little nugget. At the Royal Rumble, Sean will beat The Undertaker for the last time, and uh, alright, we're back to boob jokes. China reminds Sean to look at her in the eyes when he speaks before HBK says 1998 will be the year of DX and nobody will crash DX's party. Right on cue, Slaughter comes to the ring and DX thinks Slaughter had too many Christmas cookies this year. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He's like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Like, <laughs> Slaughter says he is indeed here to ruin Sean and Hunter's party because Triple H may be injured, but Sean Michaels is not. Sean Michaels has to defend the WWF Championship tonight, and he has to defend it against Owen Hart. Sean isn't happy, of course, but it's great for us as viewers. A big main event for the final Raw of 1997. Ken Shamrock vs Kamal Mustafa on Raw, Ultimo Dragon vs Eddie Guerrero on Nitro, we also have a Hulk Hogan promo. Dragon gets attacked during his entrance by the Cruiserweight Champion, the belt is on the line here and Eddie wants to make quick work of his opponent. When the match gets in the ring, Dragon takes a powerbomb followed by a suplex, and this one looks like it's already over. Dragon gets set up on the top rope, but he counters a superplex attempt. He goes for the Dragon Steiner, but Guerrero stops Dragon, and Eddie performs a Tornado DDT. Eddie boasts and brags before setting up Dragon for another powerbomb, but Dragon reverses, and there's the Dragon Sleeper. Eddie Guerrero gives up, and Ultimo Dragon becomes the new Cruiserweight Champion. This happens often in WCW, especially with the TV and Cruiserweight belt. Else. You get these long pay per view matches that are generally good, but then on Nitro, the belt switches hands in a matter of minutes, or in this case, a minute and a half. Eddie attacks Dragon after the bout and he throws the new champion out of the ring, nothing more comes of it. Eric Bischoff and Hollywood Hulk Hogan make their way down to the ring, and here we go, Bischoff's already shouting that Hulk Hogan's still the world champion. Hollywood says that the way it was, the way it is, and the way it always will be, is Hulk Hogan being the man and Hulk Hogan being the man who made wrestling what it is today. Last night everyone heard JJ Dillon announce that Nick Patrick was the referee assigned to the Starcade main event, and to prove it, Bischoff plays a clip from last night's pay per view. Hogan says Nick Patrick called for the bell after Sting got pinned in the middle of the ring, but Bret Hart came out and Bret Hart attacked the match referee. So, Hogan recaps. He beat Sting fair and square, Nick Patrick called for the bell, Bret Hart then came out and Bret Hart attacked Nick Patrick. Not a single lie was spoken here by the way. Hulk says he's still the champion of the world and it's WCW's job to save face. Hogan will give WCW a chance to make this right and they have to make it right tonight. Hogan doesn't fear Sting, he doesn't fear Bret Hart. Hogan's still the man and Hogan's still the world champion, according to Hogan. Bischoff wraps it up by saying JJ Dillon messed this up and JJ JJ Dillon needs to fix this. But really, it wasn't JJ who fucked this up, was it, Eric? 
Jim Ross says there's a few boys banding together backstage and they plan on taking care of Kane on tonight's show. I bet that goes fucking well. So we've got Kenny Boy vs Kama Boy, Shamrock faces The Rock at Royal Rumble so we can expect a few Nation vs Shamrock matches over the next few weeks. The match starts off and whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> damn Eric's getting his daily dose of jam there isn't he? Kama performs a standing switch but Shamrock performs a drop toe hold, Kama goes down again and this time he has to grab the ropes to avoid a leg lock and then Dilo realises his teammate isn't doing so well so he lends a hand and Shamrock hits the mat. Shamrock takes a backbreaker before getting launched into the corner, he manages to dodge Kama's charge attack, but Shamrock's charge attack also fails. Ken Shamrock goes down after a hook kick but Kama's standing sidekick doesn't find its target. Shamrock then takes the lead, he delivers a drop kick and he lands a ton of mounted punches, so Dilo and Farouk cause a distraction. Farouk talks crap to the referee while Dilo grabs Kenny Boy. Kama's having no luck with these kicks tonight as Dilo takes a foot to the throat. Shamrock performs an armbar takedown, he applies the ankle lock and the big man taps out. The nation want to launch an attack but The Rock shows up to talk a little smack beforehand. Rock says uh, he's getting a lot of fan mail with people wanting to know his opinion on the elderly and social security and Rock couldn't care less as long as The Rock's pockets are lined with green. Awesome, thanks for the intel. Rock says he's feeling good and he's looking good so next week Ken's luck runs out because he's gonna face… Farouk. Farouk clearly wasn't expecting this announcement. Rock tells Kama and Dilo to know their roles and Rock tells the nation to head back to the locker room. This is the last time I'll mention this but the transformation of Rocky Maivia has been absolutely brilliant and the guy is so fun to watch now. The lesson is simple, let guys be themselves and give guys a bit of freedom, you just never know who could become the next big megastar. Brian Christopher and Jerry Lawler take on Takamichi Noku and a mystery partner on Raw. On Nitro we've got DDP vs Mortis. Bobby Heenan comes crawling back to WCW before the DDP match takes place. He says his actions last week can be compared to someone running into a burning house to save some cats. Heen Heenan went into the NWO pit and he sacrificed himself for WCW and the traditions of pro wrestling. And Tony Giovanni and Mike Tanay can't believe what they're hearing. You just walk back in here. Now you're a part of WCW. Thank you. Row it. Interesting match on Nitro here saying as DDP and Canyon would get involved in some proper storylines in the future. Tonight though things feel a little predictable, new US champ DDP ignores Vandenberg on the apron and he hits Mortis with a swinging neckbreaker but Mortis smashes Dallas's little diamonds with a low blow in the corner. Mortis then delivers an electric chair face buster and when Paige kicks out of the follow up cover he gets choked by Vandenberg. Paige tries to fight back but he takes a back elbow in the opposite corner and Mortis then hits a corner springboard face buster. Mortis then takes a seat on Paige's neck and Dallas gets his head drilled into the mat. Paige then takes a spinning wheel kick but Mortis' luck ran out when he went for the flatliner. Paige counters Mortis' finisher with a diamond cutter and the US champ wins the match. Straightforward bout with an expected outcome but Mortis did get in a decent amount of offence here so at least there's that. On Raw we see the giant wooden box again and the commentators wonder what could be inside. Imagine if Daz Vunderkin jumped out from it and he started dancing, Jesus Christ the war would be over. We see a clip of Vince McMahon sitting in the arena earlier today and the Vin Man thanks the fans for tuning into WWF programming during 1997. He says that 1998 will be the most action packed and enjoyable year yet and Vince McMahon wishes everyone watching a happy new year. Jerry Lawler says he and Brian don't care who Takamichi Noku's mystery partner is but Jerry has an announcement to make. Jim Ross is Brian Christopher's father so Brian's new name is good old BC. Taka comes to the ring and then his mystery partner gets revealed, it's George the Animal still, what a treat. The fans go crazy for the animal as George chases good old BC and Jerry Lawler around the ring. The Lawlers get out of harm's way as George eats a turnbuckle pad and then George turns around to eat another turnbuckle pad and uh, oh uh, god damn it. Yeah George eats another turnbuckle pad as Brian and Jerry attack Taka. Christopher performs a back body drop and he taunts George afterwards. Brian then ducks under a moonsault attempt and the camera angle here makes his powerbomb counter look absolutely devastating. Still Taka comes back with a wheel kick, he then body slams Christopher and Taka pulls off that moonsault that he tried earlier on. 
Unfortunately though, the king rubs his hand all over his scrot and Taka gets punched with a cheesy fist. Lawler then gets a little brave and he goes up for a moonsault himself, but George comes in and he attacks Christopher with some sort of illegal object, and Too Sexy goes down. Taka and Christopher get up and Taka takes another cheesy fist when he tries to tag in his partner, and George has had enough. He starts striking Jerry and Brian with that weapon he's holding, looks like a piece of plastic or something, I don't know, and the referee calls for the bell. The Lawlers escape. George threatens to beat up the referee with a plastic container, and as George chases Jimmy Cordes back up the ramp, we get a look at that giant box again. What could be inside it? I asked you guys what's inside the wooden crate, and you said it could be the gobbledygooker, a lifetime supply of Bret Hart's jam, the WWE Hall of Fame celebrity wing, Steve motherfucking Blackman, all of the loot crate money EA has, Shawn Michaels' fanny pack, Shawn Michaels' smile, Triple H's nose, 19 million that Vince McMahon keeps handy at each show just in case, Hornswoggle, it's always bloody Hornswoggle, Cody Rhodes, the Shockmaster, a smaller wooden crate, Nick Patrick after his Starcade performance, Johnny Five, Brutus Beefcake's next WCW gimmick, Optimus Prime, El Dandy, Too Legit to Quit Kevin Sullivan, The Yete, Mae Young's Tutti Fruity Edible Undies, Alex Wright's Big Broadverse, and finally, Scott Steiner's Guide to Math. Before our next Nitro match, JJ Dillon gets interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund, and Dillon thanks Larry Sabisco for keeping Nitro a WCW show. Dillon wishes WCW's loyal fanbase a happy new year, and he thanks the fans for supporting the company and supporting Sting, and Dillon confirms that there's a new world champion and the decision stands. Sting defeated Hogan last night at Starcade, and Sting is the champion of the world. Dillon says he's sick and tired of hearing Eric Bischoff and Hogan cry and complain. Dylan spoke with the Stinger earlier on, who is in the building tonight, and Sting said there's a way to solve all this controversy and put things in order. Sting will put the WCW Championship on the line tonight on Nitro and he'll wrestle anyone Bischoff wants. Anyone from the NWO can step up and that includes Hulk Hogan. Dylan says it's time for Eric to put up or shut up. The crowd absolutely love this announcement, but we'll have to wait and see what Eric says. The Road Dog vs Mankind on Raw, Disco Inferno vs Booker T on Nitro. Disco and Booker see who can get the most cheers from the audience and Booker's the clear winner. We get the usual wrist locks and hammer locks with Booker T getting the better of Disco on two occasions, but a back elbow gives Disco a chance to, oh uh, never mind, it gives him a chance to get knocked the fuck out. Booker pays Disco back for that forearm but he misses an elbow drop, and you should know by now what happens when Booker misses the elbow. Yeah, there it is, the spin around and a jump kick. Disco rolls out of the ring and that was a mistake, he gets launched into the guardrail and Booker plays up to the crowd a little bit back in the ring, but Disco manages to pull off a chart buster over the top rope. Instead of going for the cover, Disco lays in the strikes in the corner, he then performs an inverted atomic drop, and check out the bump Disco takes when clotheslining Booker over the top rope. It's Booker's turn to get thrown into that guardrail, and back in the ring the Inferno applies a chin lock. Booker takes a knee to the midsection, and there's chin lock number two. Booker fights out and Disco gets all fired up after a swinging neckbreaker, but Booker comes back with his flan forearm. Disco then gets his head taken off with a spinning back kick, and Booker says that's it over. He delivers a sidewalk slam, he goes up for the Harlem Hangover, and there it is, we have a new TV champion. Booker T wins his first singles championship in WCW, and yeah, it's good to see. Disco's been a character here on Reliving the War and I've highlighted his weird on and off again pushes, but Booker T's really impressive pressed in his singles matches and winning the TV belt means there's more to come, so yeah, I'm all for it. The match was good too, it's the best of the night so far. On Raw, the Outlaws show some clips on the Titantron of Badass and Road Dog beating up Mick Foley. Foley's had a tough time with these guys recently, but he's got a few surprises in store tonight. Dude Loves music plays in the arena, and the dude still appears on the Titantron. Dude Love says the Outlaws broke his ribs and they broke his heart because Dude Love thought he could shuck and jive with these two bastards one day, but that ain't gonna happen. 
Dude Love has mercy, but a man who doesn't have mercy is mankind. Dude Love morphs into mankind and the effect looks terrible today, not gonna lie. And mankind says his body thawed out but his heart remains frozen. He says he realised that Raw's in Long Island tonight and Mrs Foley's baby boy's finally home, so that means Cactus Jack should do the honours tonight in the war zone. Cactus says there's no place like home, he's not Dorothy and he doesn't wear red slippers, but he's Cactus Jack and it's his shoes that'll be kicking the outlaws asses. Cactus says Chainsaw Charlie's here tonight, who? And Mick says he's got a surprise in store for the outlaws before making his way down to the ring. He's hiding a barbed wire baseball bat behind his back. The outlaws get out of the ring and they manage to beat up Foley on the outside. Back inside the ring, Mick gets a hockey stick broken over his back but he shakes it off and he applies the mandible claw to both James and Gunn. Badass gets shoved out of the ring and Foley goes to work on Road Dog in the corner. James takes the signature Mick Foley running knee strike and we see the classic Cactus Jack die from the apron to the outside. But the numbers game comes into play on the other side of the ring. Jack has to stop Billy Gunn from using the baseball bat and this gives James a chance to hit Foley right on the head with a chair. But this isn't enough to end the match, back in the ring we see the double arm DDT and then Billy Gunn gets inside the ropes. After everything that's happened, this is what causes the DQ finish. Foley gets sent to the outside and he lures the outlaws up the rampway. He throws Road Dog into the giant wooden box and oh, it's, it's, it's Chainsaw Charlie as announced earlier by Cactus Jack. The outlaws back off as Charlie heads down to the ring. The sparks are flying out of his actual chainsaw and not the ring post as Charlie tries to destroy the ring. And yeah, this is Terry Funk in a funked up gimmick. Why Chainsaw Charlie, I hear you ask? Well, let's read from Terry's book. I got ready for my big debut on Raw that Monday night in December and the plan was for me to come out of a box. Bruce Pritchard, one of the backstage guys, was describing to me what they wanted me to do. I said, that's it, you just want me to come out of a box? Well, yeah, he said, just come out of the box, do you want to come out as anything? Before my brain could fully process the question, my lips blurted out, chainsaw Charlie, get me a chainsaw so I can go out there. I can't explain it, it just popped into my mind. They asked me what I wanted to wear and then got me some Levi jeans and a pair of suspenders. I already had a red shirt so I kept that. Then they got me a woman's pantyhose stocking and some baby powder to put on my head. All at my request. What an idiot. I guess I could have just gone out there without anything over my head but I wouldn't have been Chainsaw Charlie with Terry Funk's head would I? I'd have been Chainsaw Terry. I came out of that box with my chainsaw and my stocking over my head and the crowd, expecting some great surprise, let out a sound that seemed strangely reminiscent of escape gas. I had visions of coming out to a tremendous roar but that wasn't exactly the reaction I got. Sable gets interviewed next on Raw while JJ Dillon and Eric Bischoff share a few words on Nitro. So Dillon says he's a little confused, backstage he was expecting someone to approach him in regards to Sting's open challenge and just then Eric Bischoff walks out. Bischoff has two things to say, first Dillon belongs to Bischoff and Dillon needs to remember that, secondly Hulk Hogan has accepted the challenge and the rematch is on. Bischoff tells Dillon not to screw things up this time before walking away and Dillon says it took months to get the first match booked but not this time. There's an argument to be made here that booking Sting in another match so quickly kind of kills his mystique a little and remember too that the Starcade Encore was still available on pay per view. It almost feels like WCW are jumping the gun and not letting things settle down. Sting vs Hogan was the most anticipated match of 1997. To get such a huge pay per view number for the bout only to put it on free television the next night really does feel like an impulsive decision based on the fact that Raw beat Nitro last week in the final hour. And you know what, the person I think that suffers the most out of all this is Sting. On Raw, Kevin Kelly's been having a few 5 on 1 matches while looking through Sable's Raw magazine photo shoot and he thought he should let Sable know all about his single player adventures. Sable says she's very proud of the magazine that goes on sale tomorrow and she wants to give fans a teaser tonight on Raw. But here comes Mark Merrow to ruin all the fun. 
Meryl demeans Sable, asking if she's gonna do something that would embarrass the Marvelous One. He then says the people came to see Meryl wrestle and they didn't come to see Sable take her clothes off. And when Double K tells Meryl to back the fuck up, Kelly takes a punch to the balls. And then Tom Brandy runs down for the save, Jesus Christ. Brandy gets Sable out of the ring but he takes a TKO on a chair for his troubles. Meryl then takes Kelly's filthy crusty magazine and he shoves the pages in Brandy's mouth and down his trunks. Lovely. And Mero says he'll do the same to every person who buys this magazine tomorrow. So that's a lot of dicks that Mero's gonna be touching up very soon. A few wrestlers call Kane out next on Raw, and over on Nitro we've got Kurt Hennig vs Chris Jericho. A clean shaven Rick Rude brings Kurt to the ring for his matchup, and Jericho shows no intimidation by squaring up to Kurt at the opening bell. Hennig slides out of the ring after missing a dropkick and taking a clothesline, and Kurt tells Ravishing Rick that someone's gonna get hurt really bad before stepping back inside the ropes. Jericho goes down after a kick and a clubbing blow to the back. He gets punished in the corner by Hennig. Jericho's able to turn it around for a moment, and Hennig takes a a jumping back kick but Jericho's momentum gets stopped by a chin lock. Works every time. Jericho gets out with a jawbreaker but Kurt gets the knees up when Chris goes for a lion salt. This looked great and I'm not sure if it was intentional either. The match then comes to an end just like that with a perfect plex and Jericho loses his mind afterwards. Kurt gets out of the ring while Jericho throws a tantrum. He hits the ring post over and over again with a steel chair. And this is it everyone, the Chris Jericho WCW heel turn is finally upon us and it's the best thing that could have happened to Chris. I've been looking forward to Jericho's change of character on Reliving the War for quite some time and this is how it all began. On Raw, the DOA, the Headbangers, Flash Funk and Scott Taylor call out the Big Red Machine. All these guys have taken chokeslams and tombstones and they want a little retribution. Kane comes out, Team Jabroni surrounds him, Kane sets off his pyro but the lights go out again and we hear the Undertaker's entrance music. The dead man walks down the rampway and the crowd are going nuts here. Taker stands face to face with his little brother and the other wrestlers are cheering and egging the Undertaker on. They want Taker to beat Kane up. But Taker ends up helping Kane and the other guys get wiped out. Kane and the Undertaker are fighting together and this gets a great pop from the audience. Taker leaves the ring and he says to the camera he'll never fight his brother and this is important. Taker says he'd burn in hell before he fights Kane. This was good though and it's quite a significant piece of Undertaker history too. It's the first time the Brothers of Destruction fought side by side instead of against each other. Jim Cornette has a few things to say on Raw while Buff Bagwell takes on Lex Luger again. Jesus fuck. Before the Nitro match, Scott Hall comes out to cut a promo and there's nothing to this at all. He just conducts his survey and it's a pretty pro NWO crowd here tonight. And Hall says the NWO are still in control even after what happened at Starcade. Smug shit Tony Schiavone thinks otherwise. Alright, so we have Bagwell and Luger's fifth televised match of December and Bagwell's gotten the best of Luger in this feud. So I'm gonna assume this is the final match of the rivalry and I'm also gonna assume that Luger wins this one, but I wouldn't be surprised if they wrestle again next week. Actually, let me check next week's Nitro, uh, sorry. Yeah, this looks like the last match. Buff says Luger can't beat Buff on TV, he can't beat Buff 1, 2, 3, he couldn't beat Buff in DC, and if Luger wants some more, he can get some in Baltimore. Very good. The match is as straightforward as they come, Buff gets an early advantage thanks to Scott Norton and Buff stays in control. Luger gets attacked on the outside by Scott, and just when you think Lex is out, he pulls off his usual clothesline and power slam comeback. Norton then gets knocked off the apron, and Bagwell gives up while locked in the torture rack. It kinda negates the Starcade match in a way, a sudden easy victory for Lex on Nitro, yet last night at the pay per view they had the longest match on the card, and Luger lost the buff. So I don't know. Luger says the Macho Man's next on Lex's hit list, so it looks like we're moving on to Macho vs the Total Package. On Raw, the Outlaws are freaked out by Chainsaw Charlie and they take it out on Michael Cole. Charlie and Jack bust through the door and Charlie waves his chainsaw around like an absolute madman and the Outlaws run away. Jim Cornette says he was asked to talk about the state of wrestling heading into 1998 and he says WCW stinks 
The NWO stinks, ECW's embarrassing, and the WWF stinks too. Last week on Raw we had people dressed up as reindeer and Christmas trees, two guys showed off their asses on TV and those two same guys had a phony match for a championship belt. Cornette says he moved from Tennessee to Connecticut which was like trading a Hawaii vacation for a bed in a cancer ward. He did this to work for the biggest wrestling company in the world and he was miserable, but he thought it was ok because he was working for the WWF. The problem is though, Cornette doesn't see any wrestling anymore, he sees great wrestlers, but they don't get time to wrestle because of all the other nonsense going on. Cornette takes jabs at Eric Bischoff, saying he has phony hair, phony teeth and a phony tan, and he takes a shot at Vince Russo when he says the New York Yankees and WWF pay too much attention to the internet, and Cornette doesn't care what some New York Yankee wants to see on television. Jim wants real old fashioned wrestling back, people with respect for the wrestling business, and Jim thinks it's about time the promoters realise that wrestling fans watching wrestling programs want to see wrestlers wrestle. Nobody has respect for tradition, but Jim Cornette does. Cornette doesn't care for the circus sideshow of sports entertainment, and if nobody else is going to bring wrestling to the WWF then maybe it's time for Jim to do it. Jim wraps it up by saying that was his address, that was his opinion, that was his commentary, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, bye humbug, thank you, fuck you, bye, I'm out of here. We've got two pretty extraordinary main events to end 1997. On Nitro we've got Sting vs Hollywood Hogan, and on Raw we've got Shawn Michaels vs Owen Hart. Before the Raw match, Jim Ross makes a big announcement. Mike Tyson, the baddest man on the planet, is gonna appear at WrestleMania 14 in 1998. Not much is given away here, but the wording could be seen as misleading. Ross says Tyson's gonna participate at WrestleMania, and Lawler wants to know who Tyson's gonna fight. Ross says he doesn't know if Tyson's gonna fight anybody. Still, this was big, big news at the time. Tyson just got his boxing license taken away after the second Holyfield fight and Tyson was in the news quite a lot in 1997, but Tyson's appearance on WWF TV didn't come cheap either. A reported $3 million was spent to bring Tyson in for WrestleMania, and do remember, Vince McMahon said he couldn't afford Bret Hart. Sure, Bret Hart was a long term company expense, but clearly there were other avenues to explore in order to keep Bret even for a shorter period of time. Speaking of the hearts, here comes Owen in some brand new ring gear. HBK makes his entrance with China, but that gets interrupted by the Blackheart attacking the WWF champion. Sean gets punished around the ringside area and the two go up the rampway where Sean gets suplexed. Inside the ring Sean gets tied up in the ropes and Owen gets in a few free shots and when Michaels frees himself, he gets back body dropped over the top rope. We come back from a break and Owen's still in control but Triple H is not ringside. Sean gets his little boy toy smashed on the guardrail, but when the match gets back inside the ring, China trips Owen up from the outside. JR says this really should be a pay per view main event as Sean knocks Owen off the apron, and HBK then throws some horrible looking jabs as Owen leans on the guardrail. Sean's stuff usually looks perfect, and I think that's why this stands out so much. Back in the ring, Owen takes a pile driver, and HBK follows this up with a DDT. Sean then applies a sleeper, Owen breaks it up. HBK applies another sleeper, Owen breaks that up too. And Sean then applies another fucking sleeper, so that's gonna be a. HBK Sleeper Hold. Break it down. Owen performs a back suplex and a back body drop, Sean gets pummeled in the corner before taking the flare corner bump, and Owen follows this up with a hard jumping clothesline, HBK kicks out at 2. Owen tries to cover Sean again after a spinning wheel kick and an overhead belly to belly suplex, but Sean won't stay down. HBK gets a chance to hit sweet chin music, but Owen ducks it and he hits an enziguri. That should be it all over, Owen applies the sharpshooter, but Triple H breaks a crutch over Owen's head and the referee calls for the bell. Owen does not not win the WWF Championship on Raw, and the show ends with Triple H attacking Owen over and over again with his other good crutch. There's definitely a sense of disappointment in the arena as Raw fades to black. Michael Buffer's here on Nitro and he's gonna introduce the WCW main event. Hollywood Hogan comes to the ring first, and here comes Sting. It's so strange seeing him walk down the ramp holding the title, it's awesome but it's still really weird. 
The two start fighting before Buffer can finish his introductions and the bell rings. Hogan attacks the stinger with right hands and he then uses the word belt as a weapon. This does not end the match by the way. Shivani says the bell didn't sound to start the match but it fucking did Tony boy. So already this is turning into a giant cluster. Hogan drops multiple elbows and Sting gets choked out on the mat before getting thrown out of the ring. The stinger takes a body slam on the outside and when they get back in the ring Hogan continues to annihilate the world champion. Finally Sting decides he's had enough. He looks at Hogan before attacking with right hands and the crowd lose their minds. A rake to the eyes makes Hogan tumble out of the ring. Sting throws Hogan into the guardrail and he chokes Hogan with his boot. And it's worth noting that Sting was never a guy who would rake the eyes or choke his opponents. This is a new Sting we're seeing right here. Back in the ring Hogan takes an inverted atomic drop and the Hulkster replies with an eye poke. Hulk then performs some hard chops before hitting a corner clothesline and Sting takes a series of right hands while on the mat. We then see the big boot. Hogan goes for the cover and Sting kicks out at two. Sting ducks a clothesline and Hulk goes down after a shoulder block, but then Sting falls into Hulk's crotch and the Hulkster gets his little Hulkamaniac smashed into a million pieces. The referee lets this slide. Hogan cheats again with a poke to the eye and then he misses the big leg drop, giving the crowd another reason to go nuts. Sting stomps on Hogan's hands, he screams at Hulk. We see a Stinger splash. Oh, Oh shit, we see another stinger splash and... Huh. Um... Hey, um... Is there anybody here? Yo, what the fuck is this shit all about? Are you kidding me? Nitro wins Reliving the War this week. Hear me out, hear me out. Bret Hart challenged Hulk Hogan. Ric Flair wants a piece of the Hitman. Chris Jericho turned heel. We had a decent TV title match. Sting's in ring, though very fucking controversial, returned to action on Nitro. Glacier got messed up. Nitro's ending was very questionable when you consider the ending to Starcade. And yes, I know they're getting all the mileage they can out of Hulk vs. Sting, but they're trying too hard. Effectively, they're destroying the hype that was created through the build up. But as an overall show, Nitro, I felt, was still more entertaining entertaining than Raw. Raw was decent too, but some of it was underwhelming, including the Owen vs Sean main event. The Cactus Jack stuff was okay too, and so was the Kane and Taker stuff, but Nitro just entertained me a bit more this week. Raw has 52 points on our leaderboard, Nitro now has 49 points, and we have 13 ties. In the television ratings, Nitro scored a 4.6, while Raw scored a 3.6. Two very good ratings this week. Well, that's 1997 in the books, my favourite year of pro wrestling and a year filled with pivotal moments, great matches and a ton of controversy. Not gonna lie guys, I'm feeling very accomplished by finishing today's episode and I sincerely hope you've enjoyed looking back at 1997 as much as I have. With that in mind, we still have a very long way to go. I know a lot of fans love 1998 and it's a year where many of you got into wrestling for the first time, so next week we start reliving it all over again. Again. Join me next week for Reliving the War 1998. Thank you so much for watching the whole series so far and being enthusiastic about the show because that's really what keeps this thing going every week. Thank you guys so so much and finally take care. Now get the